What is power? If you close your eyes and you imagine power, what do you see? I asked the same question to the oracle of Google Images, and this is what I got. Power seems to be black and white. It's about being strong. Power is a puppeteer. It's about prevailing on others. Power looks like a white man. A sword is a symbol of power. With a sword, you can impose your will. The sharper, the better. It points to the sky. The higher, the better. A rocket is a symbol of power. A technological threat to lives. The logic of dominance empowered by progress. Power stands out against the sky as far as possible from the ground. It has the shape of a sword, a rocket, a tower. It is solitary, it is edgy, and it is dangerous. The higher, the better. The bigger, the better. Yes, power can flourish, but it does it like a tree. If it generates life, it's just an externality of its natural will to elevate. Throughout the centuries, power developed detached from the grander things of life. Life was intentionally left behind, not to hold back growth. But why is it like this? When did we agree that power would be about supremacy, strength and victory over others? Did we ever have an alternative? The oldest and longest phase of human history, the prehistorical era, that's when the current model of power took its roots. In a primary instinct which kept us alive, our capacity to hunt and fight, playing a zero-sum game with other species. Yes, hunting was a zero-sum game. There was no possibility for a draw. Men either won or lost, and it meant survival or death. This powerful model wired man's brain to the point that fight or flight has become its automatic response under stress. And today, this template rules most of human activities. In the economic arena, as in the political one, we unconsciously apply a zero-sum game. We compete, we fight, we either win or lose, always, of course. How could we disobey to such a deep and historical instinct? And it's a man's instinct. The reason why Anthropos means both human being and man, is not the lack of creativity of linguists. There is instead a deep truth here. For many centuries, for millennia, the history of man overlapped with that of humanity. Male were the creators and the storytellers. Their instincts and attitudes shaped the world as we see it today. The human species carries the heritage of millennia of manhood. Today, women make up 5% only of the economic decision-making power in the world, despite being 50% of the population. Out of 146 countries, there are only 15 female leaders, eight of whom are the country's first woman in power. The economic case for diversity has been recently proven, and women have been invited to join the game, as you can see. The doors of power are open. Programs are teaching us how to behave in order to fit. Quotas are freeing our seats. Men are asked to make an extra effort not to follow their instincts in selecting peers who look and behave like them. Women received a sort of an invitation, which sounds a bit like, you're welcome to play with us. These are the rules. Please don't expect them to change according to your talent and inclinations. So, women started joining the game. 
they could wear uniforms to fit better, and don't disturb those who were there before them. Women could learn to run, to compete, to fight for the victory. They could even learn to play football and to like it. Entitled to change a few colors, as long as they don't discuss the overall outfit of power and they don't pretend to wear a tie. Few women got in, in a way or another. They proved that they can play the game. They can sit at the table and follow the rules. But why so few of them? Why, despite the clear attempt to drag women into power, women are not getting there? It looks like they need a damn good reason to leave their comfortable minority seats, and they're not getting it. I remember when I became a manager, and the head of HR proudly, me, proudly told me that I could choose the best car. I was a bit puzzled, because I was not sharing his level of excitement. In fact, I wasn't there to get a bigger car. This is not a detail, as it may seem. It is the storyteller who defines who wins and what the reward is. And if you don't like the reward, it may be because you didn't write the story. And what's worse, this makes you less interested in writing it, also in the future. Why should women get in the melee to write the definition of power? The minority seat they had for the last 5,000 years make it possible for them to sit and complain, leaving their hands free to fix all those little things around them which are not working. Free not to sign contracts they don't like, nor to follow uncomfortable roads. It takes a lot of effort and motivation to aspire to a power you don't identify with, especially if the reward is a car. Maybe good old Nietzsche was right when he said that in the end things must be as they have and have always been. You see, the effort that our society is making is to leave things as they are by asking women to adapt to current values such as finance, technology, competition. Well, I hope that this effort fails. Because what we have now, what we have today, is a unique opportunity for our species to evolve. If women change current values instead of being changed by them. I believe that our call as women is not to join the game, but to change the game. Not to adapt to power, not to replace it, but to enrich it. Up till 3,000 years before Christ, pre-European civilizations were based on the celebration of life. They adored a fertility goddess, and as the sociologist Ryan Eisler said, they believed in linking more than in ranking. There was no ranking between men and women, and they completed each other, and their joint power doubled. In these civilizations, as Marilyn Stone said it, God was a woman. The question now for us, women of the third millennium, is what is so different about women? What is the unique tribute that we can bring to the world today? Well, I believe that women have a special legacy, and that today we have the possibility and the responsibility to bring it to power. Women's DNA is wired with birth and caregiving, a characteristic that enables the success of our species as much as our capability to hunt, or even more, for there is no other species in, species in nature that needs caregiving as much as ours after birth, and in no other species as much as in ours. Being social is a unique way to survive. It's always been like this. It's a very powerful template that women can embody and project, bringing a new perspective to the world. In year 2000, a research by Professor Shelley Taylor revealed that women's response in case of threat is not to fight or flight. She wrote, from an evolutionary standpoint, 
women evolved as caregivers. In the fight-or-flight model, if women fight and lose, then they are leaving an infant behind. By the same token, it's a lot harder to run away if you are carrying an infant, and you're not going to leave it behind. So, how do women react in case of danger? What is their own adaptive model? First, research found that women under stress typically spend more time tending to their children. This tending instinct is something so rooted in women that they don't need to be mothers biologically to have it. Second, females in times of stress also form tight social bonds to seek out for others. This is the so-called befriending instinct. It means that in stressful situations, women forge alliances, they avoid fights, they rely on interdependencies. That's also a women primary instinct. How heavily do you see that the fight-or-flight model influences our current model of power? How amazing would it be to enrich it with a more female, tend and befriend attitude? That's how women can contaminate power, with care and alliances, a model which comes from an evolutionary template so close and easy to us. How do we lay the foundations of this power? Where do we learn its practices, and especially how can we share them with the world? There are some very good news here. We have everything already, everything at hand everything at home. Like all of you, I have a very engaging work, and I return home, home every day. At home, my children bring me back to the grounded meaning of life. They provide me with inspiration and reality. They complete my deepest thoughts with the concrete details of life. They feed my heart with the love I need to recharge. Being with them connects me to the high and the low, to the small and the huge, to the now and the forever. All this is impossible to leave behind for a mother. All this, which could be experienced by men and women alike, can reconnect power to the reality of life. Giving it back the roots, it's been missing for too long. John Stuart Mill said that there are no absolute economic laws the choices we make are political, and at the end, they are human choices. So things don't have to be as they've always been. If we reconnect power to life, if we bring it closer to reality, magic things will happen. In the newspapers, we re will read more about the education of our children and less about the latest results of a financial trade. We shall stop considering normal that it takes a day to a football player to earn what a school teacher earns in a year. Fun clubs will appear where people will cheer for the end of poverty with the same passion and energy we see today for the final match of the Champions League. I can't wait for the day we will stop considering war as an expression of power and start celebrating a power which is about life again. Bringing life back into power, that's how women can change the world. This power resonates with women from the very deep roots of who we are, calling us through our responsibility towards life, which cannot be limited only to our households anymore. We have to play this game. And because we won't adapt to it, we will make it better for everybody. Still similar to men and more similar to women. We're not called to do this because it's fair, not because women should be represented. This is not about helping women. It's about helping the world through women. Thank you.